A year ago, the Planet Zoo modding community experienced a significant breakthrough. The ability to introduce new species. As of this video's publication, there are a total in excess of 600 new species mods, and countless others in the works, bringing a degree of depth and expansiveness never before seen in a zoo simulation title. In celebration of this anniversary of accomplishment, this video is dedicated to telling the chronological history of the zoo game modding scene, its members, and their exploits. But the story to get to where we are today involved a lot of time, effort, and of course some luck. To understand how we got here, we have to go back more than two decades. Our son kept bringing home stray animals and not just dogs. <laughs> Things were getting out of hand. We were so relieved when we bought Zoo Tycoon for our computer. Zoo Tycoon was considered the first of its kind, the first of the namesake series that would define the zoo genre it created. Combining a diverse roster of animals, its educational qualities yet non-serious tone, and an early portrayal of zoo business simulation, made it the nostalgic, classic childhood favourite of this generation. Its longevity thereafter was attributed to the developers, Blue Fan Games, who provided the community with the Animal Project Editor, commonly abbreviated as APE a program for creating and editing the game's animals and scenery objects. This enabling of modding laid the bedrock of associating zoo games with user-driven support. Coupled with the numerous expansion packs and free downloads, it was possible for Zoo Tycoon players to oversee an enormous amount of biodiversity and made this factor one of the quintessential elements of the zoo simulation genre going forward. My name is Ashley, and that's my zoo. This is my zoo. This is my zoo. This is my zoo. And now I need uh, $15 from each of you. Zoo Tycoon 2 would launch by the same developers three years later as the hit sequel, bringing the series into the realm of 3D graphics and introducing features taken for granted in the genre now, such as precise terraforming, habitat customizability, and first person play. It wasn't a perfect game, and looking back, it has aged quite poorly in some aspects. But the game was still the premier go-to zoo sim for the past two decades, living up to its status as an accomplished sequel. One of these critical factors for this sustained popularity and longevity was, again, the modding scene. The animal roster on offer was respectable and larger than Zoo Tycoon 1 built upon quite exceptionally with the onset of expansion packs and more free downloads. But there's always another animal that could be added, another species that players wanted to see, to care for, live out their zookeeper fantasies alongside. With community hosted forums such as Zoo Tycoon 2 Roundtable, mods became extremely accessible to the general public and pretty much kept the game alive and player base invested well into the 2010s. Hendrix, a German-based designer, had been modding the prequel Zoo Tycoon 1. Their exploits, however, really took off during Zoo Tycoon 2, becoming involved in some of the scene's most memorable mods. Radical Remake was one of these, arguably the highest effort and highest quality Zoo Tycoon 2 modding project, led by Aurora Designs, of which Hendrix was a founder. Featuring a crew of talented modders, pooling together the collective skills, Radical Remake aimed to replace the entirety of the game's assets and models with higher resolution, higher fidelity textures that were more appropriate for the graphical standards coming into the 2010s. One of the biggest gripes about Zoo Tycoon 2 was its rather uncanny caricature art style, and Radical Remake attempted to improve that 
by replacing the models with as realistic versions as they possibly can. The fully realized Radical Remake Complete Collection, now available on the Zoo Tycoon 2 Nexus, boasts remakes for every single animal in the game, including all official expansions, sprinkled with a few completely new species as well. And similar treatments were also applied for foliage pieces, rocks and biomes, to bring a degree of visual quality that many consider the must-have mod to play in Zoo Tycoon 2. This standard that they set was also a hope for Hendrix and the Radical Remake crew to become the normalized modus operandi in the modding scene, emphasizing the desire for modders to focus on putting out quality works less often rather than rushing to make as many mods as they can. Besides Radical Remake, Hendrix also collaborated on a number of side projects with another famous Zoo Tycoon 2 modder under the handle Zero Svalmont, such as Wild New World, an Amazonian user-made expansion pack, or Crocodilia, introducing several crocodilian varieties into the Zoo Tycoon 2 roster. Hendrix importantly would develop Ape 2, a sequel to the modding tools for use specifically in this game, which released on the Zoo Tycoon 2 Roundtable in 2016. Exemplifying the modding philosophy and standard set by Hendrix, Ape 2 showcased a simple, easy to use GUI to maximize its accessibility, but did not shrink on the front of features, essentially encapsulating all the tools necessary to create a Zoo Tycoon 2 mod from the ground up. Hendrix also released essential quality of life mods, such as the widescreen hack. Most importantly, Hendrix also devoted much input into modding dinosaurs, which the original game adapted very distastefully. Of particular note was the Walking with Dinosaurs project, which imported species from the BBC series of the same name. Hendrix built the models based on the show, but implemented recent paleontological discoveries to provide a middle ground adaptation. The biggest and most notable Zoo Tycoon 2 dinosaur modding project was Cretaceous Calamity, of which Hendrix was initially a part of, and would feature other names important in the later stages of our story, including Harlequin's Ego. The mod attempted to introduce several fan-favorite dinosaur genera into the game, whilst greatly overcoming the technical limitations of Zoo Tycoon 2 at the same time. Although encountering problems with leaks and its share of critics over its complicated development span, Cretaceous Calamity was, in many eyes, the last great dinosaur modding project, before the release of Jurassic World Evolution. It's yours, Jurassic Park. It's your job to make it work. Just build the park. Coinciding with the golden age of Zoo Tycoon, was the age of Jurassic Park Operation Genesis, which shared a considerable overlap of fanbase with the Zoo Tycoon series. Its portrayal of dinosaurs in 3D, implementation of management simulation, and a dash of the canon's infamous Chaos Fury made it one of the most memorable dinosaur games ever made. And that came with a lot of popularity to modify it, especially since the developers of this game barely provided any post-release support. Specifically, there was a strong desire to add new dinosaur genera. The foundation of this was believed to be the creation of a script in order to extract and import dinosaur models from the game by Andre James in 2003. This was the framework on which many Operation Genesis modding tools were built upon, and with the growth of community forums such as Modding Genesis, eventually importing new textures or completely new models into the game were possible and modders even figured out a way to code those new dinosaurs into the restrictive engine. Subsequently, the explosion of the Operation Genesis modding scene enjoyed its peak around 2012 to 2017. The Modding Genesis forums closed thereafter, signaling a downturn in popularity which may have coincided with the announcement of Jurassic World Evolution. This community, however, still lingers on after transferring itself to the ModDB platform, where many of the old modding Genesis mods are still hosted.
Hendrix would implement his technical experiences from Zoo Tycoon Modding to develop community tools for Operation Genesis as well. Model, texture and animation conversion tools, as well as Blender integration are some of the contributions attributed to Hendrix. These tools have been recently updated with Python support and are available through his GitHub. It is evident that Hendrix was a lover of all things animals, but especially dinosaurs, and these early games provided the playground for modders to not only expand content for the games they love to play, but also expand their own technical skills and build a rapport with the zoo sim and dino sim community. It would take another dinosaur game to release a few years later that would give modders like Hendrix the opportunity to further this passion. Will you become one of the elite, the space combatiers, set apart by their total mastery of the spaceways? This is your ship, a Cobra-class fighter trader. The space flight video game series Elite dates as far back as 1984, popular with the early British gaming community. Considered one of the longest running video game franchises, the series is credited for its genre-defining portrayal of space flight simulation and influencing the open world genre. David Braben co-created the series and worked on the first game Elite and its 1993 sequel Frontier Elite 2. Founding his own development studio to produce the third sequel, Frontier First Encounters, Braben branded the studio after the naming convention recently ascribed to the series, Frontier Developments. For the next two decades, Frontier would work on a myriad of other titles, as well as their proprietary Cobra engine, which Braben has been developing since 1988. The Cobra engine can be found on their early simulation titles, such as Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 in 2004. Frontier Developments took the reins on the esteemed Theme Park Builder series after developing two expansion packs for the previous title. This would go on to inspire their Frillville series, built on the same engine. The 2013 Zoo Tycoon was also an important frontier milestone, the studio assuming development of yet another iconic simulation series, spiritually rebooting it a decade after Zoo Tycoon 2. By this time, however, Frontier had already devoted a significant portion of their efforts to develop Braben's ultimate dream, a sequel to the Elite series stating that it was the game he wanted Frontier to make for a very long time. The studio's fondness for simulation titles was already apparent, and they were quickly building a reputation for being capable resuscitators of classic series. But with Braben as the co-creator of the Elite franchise, and with a popular Kickstarter campaign launching in 2012 drumming up plenty of community support, it was simply a project too irresistible. Elite Dangerous would launch in 2014, heralding what many would consider the beginning of Frontier Development's modern era of video games. Elite Dangerous was also the first title featuring the fourth generation Cobra engine, developed primarily for the studio's new line of upcoming 3D PC simulation titles. This would include yet another theme park builder in Planet Coaster and its zoological sibling, but more on that later. Elite Dangerous re-embarks the classic tropes of the Elite series, allowing players to roleplay as a space pilot in an open-ended, tell-your-own-story adventure in a persistent sandbox galaxy modelled after our own Milky Way. It is here where Inaki begins his part of the story, for Elite Dangerous was the first in the Elite series to attempt massive online multiplayer, 
allowing players to wing up with their squadron and join a massive community of other players in a fully traversable open galaxy. Inaki would be drawn to the MMO multiplayer with friends aspects of Elite Dangerous and because of his innate interest in simulation games. However, it was also where Inaki realized that there were some limitations to the game that he wanted to tweak, but also where he realized there was a lack of modding capability. Inaki had previously worked on breaking open other game engines and modding them in the past, racing sims in particular, giving him some technical knowledge and reputation in the underground modding scene. Through 2014 to 2015, Inaki would work on cracking the OVL format of Elite Dangerous. This was a file format used in the Cobra engine to compress pretty much the entirety of the game's data files, containing all of the assets, sounds, textures, and code. At this point, to Inaki's knowledge, nobody had been successful in figuring it out, although he recalled there was ample discussion about it on forums. Eventually, in 2016, Inaki released his first Elite Dangerous mod, a simple plugin in relative terms, to combine third-party voice applications in order to map dynamic travel routes to other star systems, providing a more immersive, real-life pilot playing experience. Plot economic route to elevate. Continue to Sirius. This achievement of managing to import and export the OVL format laid the groundwork to understanding the Cobra engine's modding capabilities, especially for later games developed by Frontier. The potential value of this was unrealized at the time because the community around Frontier games and the modding scene around this particular engine was essentially in its infancy despite the release of Planet Coaster during this time. For all intents and purposes, Inaki's story could have just ended here. His initial work on Elite Dangerous, his initial dabbling with the Cobra engine, could have all been forgotten and ignored to the archive depths of the internet. And so it required a stroke of luck, if you will, his daughter's coincidental love for dinosaurs for Inaki's story to continue. Frontier Developments released Jurassic World Evolution in 2018, the highest profile dino park sim since, well, Jurassic Park Operation Genesis. The game was quite a commercial hit, having sold 1 million copies just 5 weeks after launch. Inaki was inexplicably drawn into the allure of this dino park sim, not because he was personally super excited to play it himself, but actually because of his daughter's interest in the franchise and all things dinosaurs. Inaki quotes that he was much more interested in the game files, having dabbled with the Cobra engine before with Elite Dangerous. Soon a particular complaint Inaki would hear from his daughter is, Dad, could we not make these maps larger? In fact, she wasn't the only one. Complaints about the limited building space in the game was commonplace on forums, the subreddit, and from content creators. And this was the spark that drew Inaki back down the modding rabbit hole. The early Jurassic World Evolution modding community used rudimentary tools to edit Lua scripts, database, and texture files, so that by the end of 2019, texture editing made up the bulk of released mods. Modders initially recolored dinosaur skins, then were able to rework their models, then eventually replaced them all together. This was led by members such as Luca, Mr. Troodon, Black Frog, and others in an early attempt at communal direction in this nascent stage of Jurassic World Evolution's modding scene. Hendrix and past acquaintances such as Harlequin's Ego, whom worked together on the Cretaceous Calamity project, would eventually create a more unified modding community to begin work on a set of open source tools to mod the Cobra engine. Inaki would join this community to contribute, providing his initial work on decoding the proprietary OVL format. The community would be officially named the Open Naja Project, with its Discord server opening in 2020. By this time, Inaki had cracked Jurassic World Evolution's OVL format, and was able to modify such things as expanding the existing boundaries of the maps, 
allowing terrain and building outside of the usual and restrictive spaces the game provides. This solved the initial request from his daughter, but he didn't feel like stopping here just yet. Using primitive Blender integration, he was also able to import his own maps into the game. Hendrix and Harlequin's ego would then take over from Inaki's work and spearhead the general Jurassic World Evolution modding effort, developing the Cobra tools into a more robust, universal framework with its own GUI intended for public release. This period of modding work saw the overcoming of significant milestones to facilitate more ambitious modding advancements, understanding the OVL file structure better, moving to a process of modders creating their own OVLs instead of injecting into the game's existing OVLs, better integration of Blender to allow importing and exporting of models, and script extenders to improve functionality of modded code. Many of these aspects are still continuously evolving as the newer iterations of the Cobra engine is released. These techniques allowed for the development of quite radical mods for Jurassic World Evolution beginning in late 2020 and into early 2021, highlighted by advanced scripting methods such as those pioneered by Kyodenic. His mods focused on improving quality of life and adding new mechanics. These included the Expedition Charter mod, which transformed the fossil acquisition system to be focused around dig sites, inspired by Operation Genesis's system. The popular Expanded Paths, Pylons and Fences mod, which featured invisible paths and guest path gates. Or the Expanded Dinosaur Behavior, vastly broadening the depth of the game's animal AI. Kyodenic experimented with and deepened the modding community's knowledge of binary coding and scripting, which would be important for facilitating gameplay related mods later on in other titles as well. The Cobra engine at this stage was still mostly an enigma. Slowly but surely, however, its secrets were being revealed. With the official developers reluctant to release any modding support and their reticent public stance on modding in general, the community was, for the most part, left to their own devices to crack the game and introduce what in their eyes was the ultimate modding goal, introducing completely new dinosaurs into the game without replacing any of its current assets. However, it wasn't until the release of a new Frontier title that would usher in a new wave of community support and fervor that would provide its biggest breakthrough to date. Planet Zoo's release in November 2019 saw the passionate revival of the community who adored the Zoo Tycoon franchise and who wished for a modernized, in-depth, spiritual successor to the zoo game genre. Based on Frontier Development's neglected stance on modding, there was much concern in the community about the potential of modifying Planet Zoo's files, given that at the end of 2019, not much progress had been done in Jurassic World Evolution. Almost immediately after launch, however, the Cobra Tool developers were already transitioning their work to adapting to the new iteration of engine in Planet Zoo. Although both games were pretty different mechanically, their files were fortunately structured quite similarly. And so, by January of 2020, just a couple of months after launch, there were already a slew of reskin mods available, pioneered by early Planet Zoo modders such as Pure Winter. Very soon after, with the techniques to forge using Jurassic World Evolution's model replacement methods, Nexus mod users were uploading Arctic Foxes to replace the Timberwolf, American Alligators to replace the Saltwater Crocodile, and Jaguars to replace the Tiger, way before they were added officially by Frontier through DLC packs. Later leaders of the Planet Zoo modding scene would be established during this period, such as Nicholas Linerider. Other notable model makers propped up in the community during this time as well, J2Bex and Havoc1199, who had modded Zoo Tycoon 2 previously, were some of these early modelers and were recognizable names in the Nexus Mods community, the go-to place for Planet Zoo public mod releases and the only official site endorsed by the modding community. However, many of these mods in this infant stage of the scene suffered from a slew of various bugs and issues. 
This was because Planet Zoo had introduced a few new mechanical features that were much deeper than what was seen in Jurassic World Evolution, and required the tool devs to adapt increasingly complex methods to unlock the inner workings of the game's code. In order to mod an animal in, and for it to feel complete, modders needed to not only build their model based on an existing rig copied from another base game animal, but also flesh out their Zoopedia entries, create differing skins such as albino variants, juveniles, male and female dimorphism, make signage and associated paraphernalia, set accurate offsets for their animations, code in their enrichment and habitat items, or add them into engine databases so they would be recognized by the game's market and breeding system. It's the sort of depth that required good coding practices which many of the early Planet Zoo mods lacked. And this was a problem that began to be noticed inside the modding community, an outsider with the general public, who downloaded and installed these mods. By the end of 2020, and upon the first year anniversary of Planet Zoo, there were more than a hundred mods released on the Nexus, and coming into 2021, many prolific names would be recognized in the community, such as Leaf, who would offer mods under the Leaf Productions handle. In the meanwhile, Inaki and the Cobra Tool devs were working on cracking open the biggest breakthrough in the engine to date, and would begin a massive modding boom for both the Planet Zoo and Jurassic World Evolution modding communities. On the 4th of March 2021, Harlequin's Eager released the first new species mod for Jurassic World Evolution, the Torvosaurus. A day later, in collaboration with Hendrix, released the first new animal species mod for Planet Zoo, the Phylocene, heralding the beginning of the Planet Zoo and Jurassic World Evolution modding era where new, distinct species could be added into the game without replacing any animals from the original roster. This was attributed to the understanding, processing and enabling of prefabs, a sort of file storage medium within the OVL format structure. For instance, a prefab of an animal in Planet Zoo would contain its model, its textures, its skeleton data, its animation code. It would also contain databases to supplement the animal's definition in the game's subsystems. Modders had already worked with an initial framework around utilizing prefabs, but this time, Inaki had enabled the insertion of new species by figuring out how to tell the game to recognize new OVLs as their own content packs essentially tricking the game to think that new mods were newly installed DLCs. As Inaki describes it, Prefabs was the modding community's next toy. Quite a big toy it has to be said. It gave them the freedom to design and subsequently define their own assets and add them into the game, be it animals, props, paths, fences, whatever. Any game asset could theoretically be edited and implemented into the game and be recognized as a separate entity without replacing any of the game's current assets. That's the important and crucial part in all of this. Okay, welcome to the Planet Zoo New Species mod tutorial. Let's get started. So let's see, what kind of animal do we want to make a new species today? On March 15th, 2021, Harlequin's Ego would release two videos on his YouTube channel, new species modding tutorials for both Planet Zoo and Jurassic World Evolution. Him and Hendrix had uploaded the latest iteration of the Cobra tools on GitHub for public users to begin making their own mods. By now, Harlequin's Ego had also uploaded the Sand Tiger Shark and Shavolsky's Horse. Leaf Productions had uploaded the Eastern Moose, Suffolk Sheep, Red Fox and Tufted Capuchin Monkey, whilst Nicholas Line Rider released the Ayudad and the Main Wolf. Since then, these mods have changed a lot, but they were among the first recorded new species uploads on the Nexus. And thus, the floodgates were officially open. New species were finally now available to be publicly played and made in both Planet Zoo and Jurassic World Evolution. Modding a new species is no easy feat. New animal species have to be applied and built onto an existing animal rig, 
a skeleton or frame if you will, that dictates the animations and behaviors. This was fine to expand the niches of similar animals we already had, such as adding more subspecies of certain animal groups, and so modders were dependent on DLC to introduce completely new rigs to implement some of the more challenging species. The release of the aquatic pack was fairly significant in this regard, as rigs were now available to morph aquatic animals, with a degree of jankiness of course. We could see this with the first few aquatic mods. Harlequin's Ego Sand Tiger Shark mod, or some of the early Cetacean mods, were mapped to the aquatic pack's grey seal, or giant otter rig. Beginning in mid-2021, there was an evolution in the community. To move on from the mostly solo, self-coded and self-modelled works we see in the early Planet Zoo mods, to a greater collaborative effort seen in the uploads of today. As the scene grew and as excitement for modded animals ripened, there was also an increasing desire for a higher standard of quality. As the saying goes, two hands are better than one. But that isn't to say there weren't any high quality solo efforts, the early mods of Narwhaler come to mind as setting an exceptional standard, but I digress. There were those in the community who excelled with using the tools or had coding knowledge, whilst others were brilliant modelers with an eye for detail and realism, and others may have just been a jack of all trades with limited skills in a range of scopes. This cooperative began to take form in efforts to at first remake existing mods, such as Gaboy remodeling Havoc 1199's leopard subspecies. But soon this later blossomed to a more general trend where many authors would collaborate together. Uploaders such as Leaf Productions, Havoc, and Giorno Pizza, for instance, have collaborated extensively with Gaboy, MGR, Tosca, Buff Zoo, and Jen as examples. Through correspondence, they explained that there weren't really any clearly defined roles, and all modders would chip in with work where they can, whether that be visual work or coding work, despite many of the mods condensed into only a few uploaders on the Nexus. Because Nexus mods can only be uploaded by one author, sometimes it's difficult to appreciate the breadth of personnel that is truly involved. In fairness, modding projects are never really managed in closed spaces as well, with plenty of supporting discussions happening in the Discord, with the most experienced community figures such as Leaf and Nicholas Linerider always ready to lend a helping hand. This could be easily seen with the release of compilation packs, not dissimilar to the time of Zoo Tycoon 2. The first of these was the Flamingo pack made by Leaf Productions, Jen and Nicholas Linerider, featuring five flamingo species. Nicholas Linerider would be the lead figure organizing the Safari Animal pack, which featured over 40 African animal varieties, compiling works from 13 authors. Collaboration is especially important with the need for regional localization. As Planet Zoo and later modding attracted players from all corners of the globe, and also because modders themselves spoke a variety of languages, there was a specific need to translate the mods to be as widely accessible as possible. Luckily, there are no shortage of volunteers in the community, and by using services such as Trello, modders can upload their original English localizations and have them translated retroactively. As Blender integration improved, it was possible to, with some tweaking, port over high quality models made in other games. For instance, marine animals from the game Endless Ocean developed by Arika, sharks from Tripwire Interactive's Maneater, even dinosaur models from the latest Jurassic World Evolution 2. High quality models from Zoo Tycoon 2 modding projects were revamped for use into Planet Zoo as well. Zero Svalmont, for instance, was an avid shark enthusiast during Zoo Tycoon 2 days, and his work on that animal group provided the model for many of the shark ports for Planet Zoo's own mods. Utilizing the particle system in Blender, modders could comb precise hair fins to make the fluffy ears of the Victorian koala, or the distinct tufted ears in Jen's upcoming update of the Red River Hog. They can also generate thick and lush fur on the woolly mammoth, or build brand new quills as on the North American porcupine. With the Europe Pack DLC, it is now also possible to assign more than two textures to animals. 
the upcoming update for the Jatal or Axis Deer mod will feature four texture skins with differing color patterns, including albino and melanistic variants. This recent discovery was thanks to the modders taking advantage of the pack's fallow deer code, allowing modded animal individuals to be outfitted with unique fur coats and skin patterns, adding a degree of visual variation never seen before in Planet Zoo mods. Prefab development in the meanwhile also continued. The Cobra tool developers were also able to unlock components, which are structures the prefabs are made off of that define their in-game functionality. With this advancement, custom gameplay could finally be implemented into Planet Zoo, providing modders with a platform to introduce completely new animal behaviors without copy and pasting from the base animal rigs. This can be seen with the Kirk's Dick Dick mod by Jen, featuring the first fully functional growing juvenile. Script writing not dissimilar from Kyodenic's Jurassic World Evolution mods made other gameplay mods possible as well. Planet Zoo Plus, for instance, implemented roller coaster and other ride mechanics from Planet Coaster. This mod also overhauled many other features of Planet Zoo with an emphasis on realism and quality of life, and was another collaborative project between Giorno Pizza, Buff Zoo, and Leaf Productions. Kyodenic would also contribute massive gameplay mods to the Planet Zoo depository as well, with a better first person mode and free build expanded building mods. From late 2021, rig creation was now technically feasible. By adjusting or replacing redundant bones in the spline, such as the tongue bone, modders can more realistically portray certain animals. This can be seen in Mergy Saval or Giorno Pizza Zebu. Both authors moving around bones in the skeletal spline to improve the respective animal's postures. This is still an ongoing development however, and for the most part these methods are still very experimental, so there is plenty of room for improvement in this regard. The scene itself is also continuously growing. There's always more modders out there ready to contribute. Recently we've seen some other notable modders pop up with their own collection of quality mods, such as Seth and Bonko Hardwood. Jurassic World Evolution 2 launched in November of 2021, with both players and modders for the most part abandoning the previous title to work with more of the gameplay features available in this sequel. Regardless, the engine has proven to be quite similar, and so far there haven't been any notable breakthroughs on this front, but there's still considerable modding activity as modders port over their old creations. The addition of the Avery and Lagoon should allow for much more mod diversity than just land dinosaurs, however, so in a sense, this sequel has certainly a higher ceiling for potential. As mods continue to proliferate, as the games get DLCs and patches, the tool developers and modding community are constantly fighting to adapt to changes with the Cobra engine. It seems every few months there's a new innovation discovered to revolutionize the modding scene again and again. So what's next? Well, Inaki says the next steps are to develop game-specific tools, as a prop, asset, or animal in Jurassic World Evolution 2 isn't written the same as a prop, asset, or animal from Planet Zoo. The current tools are generic, universally applicable, but Inaki says the team wants to transition to a more specialized approach to streamline modding workflow and improve the final quality. There is still plenty of research and development required to reach the stages that Hendrix, Harlequin's Ego, and Inaki want it to be at. Already we've seen so much progress with mods it's hard to fathom what the future holds, but it's a feeling among the tool developers that they have just begun to scratch the surface of the Cobra engine. All it takes is another discovery to bring forth another modding revolution. Of course, there's a lot more people in this story who directly and indirectly brought the scene to where we are today. This video is dedicated to each and every one of their contributions, for the modding community is not just a few experts leading the charge, it's an amalgamation of unsung heroes who each play their part in this project built out of the pure love for the games they enjoy. For modding has always been a non-profit enterprise run by the community for the community, 
as games come and go, player bases rise and fall, developers stop support and move on. It'll always be down to the modders to enrich the longevity of these games and keep them well and truly alive after all these years. Special thanks to the correspondents and others for giving their time and assistance in the making of this video. And of course to the Patreons whose funding made it all possible. You too can support the channel and more works like this for as little as a dollar a month.